I'm Professor Rad, and this is Precalc video 319, inverse trigonometry. In this video, we're going to develop um, inverse trig functions. And uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and do that. And we'll do a few examples with them as well. So one of the things that's challenging about trigonometric functions when it comes to finding an inverse is that they're periodic, which means they are definitely not one-to-one. -one. Right. So in order to find an inverse of a function, you need it to be one to one. So there's a problem with all of our trig functions because all of them are going to fail the horizontal line test. So I've drawn all of our six trig functions here and they're all problematic with regards to finding uh, one to oneness. Right. So what we need to do is we need to restrict the domain of the trig function if we're going to be able to invert it. So here's how we do that. When I'm looking at the sine function, what I would like to do is I want to find a nice interval where it hits all of the possible y values it can hit only once. I don't want it to repeat any y values. So for instance, I don't wanna pick, like say the interval from zero to pi because it only hits the positive y values in that interval and it hits some y values more than once. It's not one-to-one -one on the interval. So instead, I'm going to pick this section that ends at pi halves and starts at negative pi halves. So I'm looking at this piece of the sine function, just this little section. This little section here is going to hit all of the y values that sine hits. So it goes from negative 1 up to positive 1 and it never repeats any of those y values. So if I look at just the blue section, that blue piece is one-to-one. -one. It passes the horizontal line test. So for the sine function, in order to find an inverse, we're going to restrict its domain to be from negative pi halves up until positive pi halves. And the range on the interval goes from negative one to positive one. Now let's try and do the same thing for cosine. So for cosine, this time if I tried to do that same domain from negative pi halves to pi halves, I run into the issue where I only get the positive piece of the cosine curve. So instead, I'm going to start here at the top and follow the curve until the bottom point here. So when I'm looking at my cosine curve, the restricted domain I'm going to use is going to be from zero up until pi. So my restricted domain is zero to pi. And that's because we hit all of the y values for cosine and we only hit them once. As with the sine curve, the range for cosine is gonna be from negative one to positive one. Now, as we're stating these uh, restricted domains and the ranges, remember that the range in the domain for an inverse function is like the opposite of the actual function. So when we go to look at the inverse of the sine function, the inverse will have a domain of negative one to one and a range of negative pi halves to pi halves. Okay, so we're gonna bear that in mind uh, for the future when we look at the inverses of these functions. But now we're going to carry on and we're going to find similar domains for the other four trig functions. And it turns out that the ones that I've listed on the top here work really well from negative pi halves to positive pi halves. So if I look at tangent, that's this piece here from negative pi halves up until pi halves. The only difference here for tangent is that I'm not going to include negative pi halves to pi halves because that's where I have asymptotes. Tangent's not defined there. So the domain I'm going to be looking at is going to use parentheses, negative pi halves to positive pi halves. And the range of tangent, well, it goes, it has these asymptotes, so it's going to go down to negative infinity and up to positive infinity. So the range is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. For cosecant, negative pi halves to pi halves is going to work well as, as well, but we're going to have a tiny little hole in it. So if we uh, check it out, here's why that's happening. So from negative pi halves up until zero, we get the negative component of cosecant. 
Then we have an asymptote at zero. And then to the right, we get the positive component. So because cosecant is kind of split up by that asymptote, its negative piece and its positive piece are interrupted by the asymptote, no matter what interval we picked, we'd end up having to union two intervals together. So the domain for um, cosecant that we're going to restrict it to is going to be including negative pi halves up to zero, but not including zero, union zero, but not including it, up to pi halves and including it. And for the range, this is the usual range of cosecant. It goes from negative infinity up to negative one, skips this middle here and goes from one to positive infinity. So we have negative infinity to negative one, union one to positive infinity. All right. And then uh, just like tangent and cosecant have similar restricted domains to sine, cotangent and secant will also have similar restricted domains to cosine. So for cotangent, we're going to restrict it to be from zero to pi because we get to see the whole piece of the cotangent curve there. But as with tangent, it has asymptotes at those points, so we don't include them. So we have from zero to pi. And then for the range, it hits all real numbers, so we have negative infinity to positive infinity. For secant, it's gonna have a similar issue to cosecant. So we're gonna have a little piece that we cut out, but that's okay. So we're gonna start out here at zero and go to the right. Then we're gonna cut out the piece at pi halves because the asymptote. And then we're gonna go up to pi. So we have including zero up to pi halves, but not including it. And then picking up right after and going up until pi. And the range for secant is the same as the range for cosecant. So it's gonna go from negative infinity to negative one, union a positive one to infinity. So here's what these restricted domains look like for um, when we go to find the inverses of these functions. Now, let's see how this connects back to a unit circle. So for all of these top functions here, for sine, tangent, and cosecant, when we're looking at negative pi halves to positive pi halves, that means we're looking at from zero to minus pi halves and from zero to positive pi halves. So when we are looking to find the inverse of a sine function and we're using a unit circle for reference, we wanna find an angle that's between negative pi halves and positive pi halves that's going to match the conditions we've been given. So that's why in the last video, we were looking for angles within particular windows because if we're undoing a trig function, we wanna be in this particular window for sine, tangent, and cosecant. For cosine, cotangent, and secant, we want to be between zero and pi. So we want to be from zero to pi. So we're going to be looking for a similar thing. We're going to be looking for an angle, but this time the window we're looking for is from zero to pi. So I'll often be referring to these as we're looking in the east or the north. So when we're undoing um, sine or tangent or cosecant, we're gonna look in the east for an answer. And when we're undoing cosine, cotangent or secant, we're gonna be looking in the north for an answer. So I'm gonna step out of the way here in case you wanted to pause this and copy anything down um, that you might find interesting. Um, and, uh, and the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to sketch what the inverse of sine, cosine, and tangent are all going to look like. All right, so I made a little bit of space for us to be able to do that, but I wanted to keep sine, tangent, and cosine available so we can use them to help us graph their inverses. So remember that the inverse of a function 
is uh, the same as the reflection over the line y equals x, or think of it as swapping the x and y values. So you'll notice I didn't label my axes here because uh, I wanted to make sure we were comfortable with why we're going to label them the way we are. So remember, for inverses, x and y switch places. So that means our x and our y axes are going to switch places as well. So let's start out by sketching um, inverse sine. And we'll do that. Yeah, let's do that one over here. So on here, my x-axis went from negative pi to pi. So now I have to make sure my y-axis goes from negative pi to pi. So there's negative pi. There's positive pi. And then we're going to go um, up to 1 and negative 1. Now, because we've restricted the domain, we're only looking at this blue section here. So for the blue section, it went through the point negative pi halves, negative 1. So its inverse will go through negative 1, negative pi halves. So negative 1, negative pi halves. Then it went through the point 0, 0. And then it went through the point pi halves 1. So it's going to go through 1 pi halves. For this next part, we want to make sure that we are curving uh, the inverse function appropriately. So to do that, um, let's see, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty close to the y-axis here. So that means it's going to be pretty close to the x-axis here. So we're going to be curving up this way. And then for this one, similar kind of thing. So it's going to be pretty close to the y-axis. So that means it's going to be pretty close to the x-axis as it curves down that way. All right, so that is going to be the graph of our inverse sine. So we can write that as sine inverse of x. So notice that we're using like you would use um, f inverse. We're putting that little negative 1 attached to the sine function. So be careful, this does not mean reciprocal. It means inverse, just like f inverse means the inverse of a function. Now, inverse sine is going to have a domain that goes from negative 1 to 1, because those are x values. And it's going to have a range that goes from negative pi halves up to pi halves. Okay, let's try tangent. Let's do the inverse of tangent together. So for the inverse of tangent, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to label the x-axis um, according to the y-values and the y-axis according to the x-values. So um, let's do tan inverse over here. So the inverse tangent. So we're going to go, uh, this will be 1 and negative 1. And then uh, we're going to go uh, pi's, so negative pi, positive pi. Now, one of the tricky things about tangent are those asymptotes. So let's get, let's get those out of the way first. So we have an asymptote at negative pi halves and positive pi halves. So remember, x's are now y's and y's were x's. So because we had a vertical asymptote at negative pi halves on the function, its inverse will have a horizontal asymptote at negative pi halves. Similarly, because tangent has a vertical asymptote at positive pi halves, its inverse will have a horizontal asymptote at positive pi halves. Then we went through the point 0, 0, so nothing changes there. And then pi fourths 1, so now we'll be at 1 pi fourths. And negative pi fourths, negative 1, so now we'll be at negative 1, negative pi fourths. And then we'll connect the tangent curve um, as as a reflection here. So we're going to be getting closer to that asymptote, kind of shimmying in this way through the origin. So uh, inverse tangent has a domain 
of all real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity because we have these arrows on either end. And then our range is now what's restricted. We're going from negative pi halves to pi halves and not including them. Okay, so we did those two together. How about you try doing um, the inverse for cosine now on this remaining graphing space? So see if you can use the reflection techniques that we've talked about to sketch the inverse of cosine. And then when you're done, you can unpause the video and I will have the answer here and we can check it out. Alrighty, so let's see how we did. So here's my inverse cosine curve. Um, it's really only uh, above the x-axis. And that actually makes sense because we have a different restricted domain uh, for the cosine than we did for either tangent or sine. Um, so I have a domain that goes from negative one to one and a range that goes from zero to pi this time. So inverse cosine is gonna be a little bit different. Okay, now um, the other thing I wanna mention is that sometimes an alternate notation is going to be used for inverse trig functions. So instead of um, what looks like sine with the minus one, you might see this written as arc sine of x. Similarly, um, instead of using this inverse notation, you might see arc tan, and you might see arc cos. So sometimes this arc is used instead of this inverse notation. Um, my tendency is to just use the inverse notation. That's the one that I personally prefer. Um, but just know if you head into another math class, you may see this arc being used instead. So that's what that means. It means the same thing as the inverse of the trig function. So now that we've got some graphs out of the way, why don't we evaluate a few things? All right, so let's evaluate some inverse trig expressions. I'm gonna keep these here just for reference. Let's remember that sine, tangent, and cosecant, we're looking for values in the east. And for cosine, cotangent, and secant, we're looking for values in the north. So the first thing that I'm gonna do when I approach a problem, um, I'm gonna hopefully not spook it too much as I approach it, but uh, for inverse sine, I'm going to draw the space that I'm looking for my answer. So for inverse sine, we're looking in the east. So I'm looking for an answer that's gonna be in either quadrants one or four. What this statement is asking me to do is to find the angle for which sine is equal to negative one half in this interval. So sine is gonna be the y value of negative one half. So here we go. And that's looking like a negative pi over six. So this will be negative pi over six. Now, I don't want to think of this angle as 11 pi over six, even though it's coterminal. I do want to think of it as negative pi over six because I'm looking at negative pi halves to positive pi halves. So keep that in mind as well as you're checking your answers. Next, we have inverse cosine. And inverse cosine is going to be in the north. So we're going to draw a picture here. Now we want to know when is the um, cosine value equal to zero. So cosine is the x value. So that's going to be here. This point here will have an x value of zero. So uh, that angle is going to be pi over two. So inverse cosine of zero is pi over two. Let's do one more together. So for part C, we have inverse cosine of two. So because we have cosine, we're going to be looking in the north. And we wanna say cosine of what angle is going to give us two? It's kind of a trick question because there's no such angle. Cosine is always gonna be a number that's between negative one and one. So there's no way we're gonna be able to get up to two. So this one does not exist. So my answer would be, does not exist. Okay, so I'm gonna recommend that you pause the video here and try out the remaining three problems and see if you can come up 
with the correct diagram so you know whether you're looking in the east or in the north, and then see if you can find the right angle. And then when you're done, you can unpause the video and uh, we'll have the answers on the board to check. All right, so let's check our answers and see how we did. So for part D for secant inverse of two, I got pi thirds. So the way I reasoned through that was I'm looking for the angle theta when secant of theta equals two. That's what this notation means. So um, I don't have secant memorized as well as I do sine and cosine. So I know that secant is reciprocal of cosine. So if secant is two, that would mean cosine is positive one half. So when cosine, the x value is positive one half, that's gonna be at the angle of pi thirds. For cotangent, again, we're looking in the north for cotangent. And uh, for the inverse, oh, this should be inverse cotangent, my word. That was a typo. Hopefully you guys realize that as you're working through. So to find inverse cotangent of negative one, what I'm gonna do there is, um, I know that tangent and cotangent are gonna be one or negative one on the 45 degree angles on the pi fourths. So um, over here we have um, in quadrant two, that's when cotangent will be negative. So we're gonna be at three pi over four. And then to finish up with inverse tangent of root three, I got pi thirds. The way that I did that was this time for tangent, we're looking in the east, so I drew the east. And uh, when I think of root three, the only way we can get that is by doing root three over two over one half, right? If I multiplied top and bottom of this expression by two, I would get my root three. So the x value is a half, the y value is root three over two. So that's gonna happen at pi thirds. Again, if you have some more of these values memorized, so if you memorize root three, um, like tangent of pi thirds is root three, um, or secant of pi thirds is two, that's fine. You can use that to your advantage here. But uh, I, like I've said a few times, I have trouble memorizing stuff. So I rely on my sine and cosine, my figuring out abilities to uh, kind of manifest those values, um, figure out what they're gonna be. All right, so now that we've got some inverse trig values of specific numbers, let's try and find the inverse trig function of, you know, a function. Alrighty, so for this example, we have the function f of x is three minus cosine of x. We want to identify the restricted domain that we're gonna have to use if we wanna find the inverse of this function. Then we wanna find the inverse on that restricted domain. And then lastly, we're going to state the domain of the inverse function that we find. So for part A, To identify the restricted domain, because this is cosine, that means we're going to restrict the angles that we look at. Cosine is in the north, so the restricted domain goes from zero to pi. So our restricted domain here is from zero to pi. For part B, the way that we're going to find the inverse function is we're gonna start out like usual, switching the roles of X and Y. So we're gonna have X, equals three minus, oh, nice and cozy, cosine of y. Now what we're gonna do is, um, it's very similar to like when we were finding the inverse of a logarithmic function, where we wanted to get the logarithm alone and then undo the logarithm. Here we wanna get just the trig function alone and then we'll undo the trig function. So um, because this is a negative here, I'm actually going to add cosine of y to both sides as my first move. So I'm gonna have x plus cosine of y is equal to three. And then I'm gonna subtract x to bring it over to the other side. So we have cosine of y is three minus x. So now I've solved for the cosine of y. For the next part, one way you can think of it, like you know, if you have something squared and you square root both sides, one way you can think of this is now we're going to cos inverse both sides. So we're going to take the inverse cosine of both sides. So that inverse cosine and cosine will cancel, and that gives us just y. And on the right, we're going to have the inverse cosine of 3 minus x. So this means that f inverse is going to be uh, cos inverse 
of three minus X. All right, so then uh, let's address part C, which says to state the domain of F inverse. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky when you have your inverse cosine functions. So when I'm thinking about um, my answer here, I want to be thinking about the range of cosine because the range of cosine is the domain of inverse cosine. So the range of cosine goes from negative one to one. So that's what I'm going to start thinking about. I'm going to think of negative one to one. Now, that's the only value I'm allowed to input into an inverse cosine expression. So on my inverse cosine here, the argument is three minus X. So I need to make sure that that argument fits within this interval. So I need to make sure that three minus X is less than or equal to one and greater than or equal to negative one. So now I have a compound inequality that I'm going to go ahead and solve. So I'm gonna start by subtracting three from all three components. So that will give me negative four is less than or equal to negative X is less than or equal to negative two. And then we'll divide everything by a negative one. Be careful because that's gonna switch this inequality symbol around. So that will give me four is greater than or equal to X is greater than or equal to two. So this means that the domain for the inverse function is going to be from two to four. Kind of wacky, right? So another way you could think about finding the domain if the algebraic approach is not your cup of tea is you can think about this original function and what its graph would look like. So think about this would be a vertical uh, reflection of cosine. So we flip it upside down and then we shift it up by three. So that means the bottom point of our cosine function that's normally at negative one, when I shift it up three, it's now gonna be at two. And the top point of cosine that's usually at positive one, when I shift it up three is now gonna be at four. So the range of this function is gonna go from two to four. And the range of the original function is the domain of the inverse. So that's another way to kind of think about and reason through what the domain of the inverse function will be. All right, let's do another example of finding the inverse of a trig function. Alrighty, so for this example, we're gonna let f of x be pi plus inverse tangent of x minus a quarter. Now you might think that's kind of weird to have pi plus a thing, but remember an inverse trig function undoes the trig function. So instead of taking an angle and spitting out a ratio, it's going to take a ratio and spit out an angle. So very often when you have a um, inverse trig function um, already written with that inverse notation, you'll have things that involve pi because this value really is a radian. It's, a, it's an angle measurement. So uh, first we're gonna identify the restricted domain. And because we have this inverse tangent here, to help me think of domain, I'm gonna think of the range of tangent. Now the range of tangent is gonna go from negative infinity to positive infinity. And there are, is no issue with the domain there. So actually this function is gonna have a restricted range more so than a restricted domain. So for A, our domain is just negative infinity to infinity. Then for B, let's find F inverse. So we'll start out by replacing X with Y and vice versa. And then we wanna go ahead and solve for Y. So in order to uh, solve for Y, we wanna get the tangent piece all by itself. Since it's a positive tangent, this time I'm just gonna move pi. So I'm gonna subtract pi from both sides. Now that I have the trig expression all by itself on one side, I can think of it like taking tangent of both sides of the equation to undo that inverse tangent. So when I do that, I'm gonna get tangent of x minus pi on the left 
and then the tangent and tan inverse will cancel and we get y minus a quarter. So to finish this one up, we're just gonna add a quarter to the other side. So I'll do one fourth plus tangent of x minus pi, and that's gonna equal y. So my inverse function, f inverse of x, is gonna be one fourth plus tangent of x minus pi. Okay, and then to finish, we need to state the domain of F inverse. So this is where we're actually gonna see a restriction. So for tangent, uh, tangent's one that ends up in the east. So what that means is we want the input for the tangent function to be between negative pi halves and pi halves. So this is our input, X minus pi halves. So that has to be between negative pi halves and pi halves. Now I'm just using a less than here instead of a less than or equal to, because remember tangent has those asymptotes at pi halves and negative pi halves. So that's why we just have the less than instead of the less than or equal to. So next to solve, I'm just gonna add pi to both, well, all three pieces of the inequality. So that's gonna give me a positive pi halves and then a three pi over two. So that means my domain is gonna go from pi halves up to three pi over two. And there we go. All right, so that's gonna conclude this video on our introduction to inverse trigonometry. Um, so we found some inverse trig values, we found some inverse trig functions. What we're gonna look at in the next video is um, some messy consequences of these restricted domains. So for example, um, we want an inverse to undo a function perfectly, right? So if I have, um, you know, 2x, if I divide that result by two, I'll get back to x perfectly, doesn't matter what x was. But if I have, let's say, two pi over three, two pi over three is outside of the east. So if I wanted to undo sine of 2 pi over 3, I'm not going to get 2 pi over 3 back. I'm probably going to get pi thirds back. So we're going to have to finagle things a little bit differently when we go to use our inverse trig functions to undo trig functions and vice versa. So that's what we'll be looking at in our next two videos. So I hope this was a good introduction to inverse trig for you. Um, I hope it helped uh, kind of demystify some of it. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video. But till then, have a wonderful day. Bye for now.